Hi, everyone. This is Jason Barack of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest, Dr. Ron Paul. I'm excited to have you back on. Thank you. Good to be with you. Now, Dr. Paul, I asked my listeners to submit questions for this interview, and we got an amazing question, I think. Here's our question from George in Florida. Do you think restoring the rule of law in the United States would require throwing in jail a lot of people in government, a lot of people on Wall Street, uh, a lot of bankers didn't go to jail after the 2008 financial crisis? Would you agree with that? Well, I think morally that would be uh, they'd, it'd be justifiable. I think the odds are pretty slim because they're pretty slick on that, and there would be too many. But uh, I, I think uh, when I look at that overwhelming problem that, uh, yes, uh, a few of them need to be in jail or a lot of them need to be in jail, that uh, the biggest job we have is counteracting them, uh, you know, in the banking industry and the, and the Federal Reserve and this group. This is immoral and unconstitutional, and, and they rip us off, and the rich get richer and all these things. Uh, that whole system has to come down. That's the best way to punish them. But when it's outright fraud, uh, which it was, uh, there were some countries uh, that actually imprison the people who uh, were doing the ripping off. Uh, so that would be the case. Uh, I, I just see <clears throat> see it that it would be a very great task, uh, rounding them up. Uh, but I think the destruction of that system that where they were able to rip us all off has to be uh, eliminated. Yeah, and in order to have free markets and capitalism, we have to have private property rights. We have to have rule law. And when people think they're above the law, like Hillary Clinton, Comey, you know, Loretta Lynch, all these scandals with all these high level, you know, bureaucrats and operatives, it's incredibly frustrating for the person on Main Street because, you know, if they get a speeding ticket and they don't pay it, they're going to risk going to jail. Whereas, you know, these guys are getting away with high level felonies. Yeah, and that's one of the biggest frustration because we don't really have uh, a justice system. It's an injustice system. And uh, not only are the laws written badly when you look at drug laws and different things like that, but then when you look at the politicization of what goes on, who gets punished, and I think what's going on right now uh, between uh, the deep state, uh, the uh, <clears throat> Republican administration under Trump as well as Obama, there's a lot of law breaking being done there, but it's the system that is uh, so rotten. So uh, pr prosecution, uh, you know, the prosecutors and, and the, and the uh, whole, whole uh, justice system, I think, is totally out of control, way too big, and that's one of the reasons I hate to see the nationalization of that whole system. And uh, if you were trying to bring about um, a, a lot more justice, it, the uh, judicial system wouldn't be such a monopoly and monolithic and run by uh, the, the people out of a national system. I agree. I think things should be decentralized, but that's unfortunately not the way things seem to be going right now. Right, that's for sure. I, I want to ask you your opinion on President Trump. Do you, do you think he's a neocon, or do you just think he stupidly surrounded himself by neocons? Well, he he sure he sure has made those appointments. You know, yesterday uh, I talked about Sessions why he ought to be fired. And I generally don't do that, but then uh, today I was getting uh, uh, somebody. I said, you know, we ought to go down the list. It looks like there's a bunch of them ought to be fired. So it's the infiltration by the neocons and and liberals and Keynesians. Uh, uh, it, it's just a, it's a, just a philosophic uh, problem that that we have. So, but Trump is a Trump is a utilitarian, a pragmatist that has no sound footing philosophically, and uh, he he sees nothing wrong with uh, you know flip flopping and uh, changing his mind, and uh, that that is where where the problem is. But the people he he has surrounding him, evidently, even if he tries to get outside the uh, the system, you know, then the deep state comes down hard on him. And even though I think and others agree even from our viewpoint, that he has capitulated too much and almost like trying to appease uh, the, the deep state and uh, the establishment, yet he gets no points for it. Um, so uh, I think that he it isn't so much that he has this firm philosophy that we have to contend with. He, he doesn't have one, and he's all over the place. But uh, I see that the only way you can answer this is for people who deal in ideas to try to uh, use those ideas to, uh, you know, counteract the policies that are going on. So as, as, as unusual as Trump is, 
it's really the same old story. There's uh, the consensus in this country is that we have, uh, you know, an interventionist government. You know, they want to intervene in our personal lives. They want to intervene overseas, and they certainly want to intervene in, in our economic lives all the time. Uh, but this is structural. It's been around for a long time. Uh, you know, that's all the young people learn and study, and the politicians, they've learned Keynesian economics. They know that nothing could happen if you didn't have a central bank, and you certainly don't want to go to something stupid like a gold standard. So it's 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 philosophic. He's just part of it, and I think he uh, he sort of you know is such a mixed bag because the current system isn't working. It used to be that uh, it was just a matter of picking the right side of intervention. You know, well, we'll deal with this, and we were very wealthy, and we could divvy up the loot, and the liberals could get what they want, and conservatives could get their militarism, and everybody seemed to be happy. But right now, you know, whether it's the cities and towns and counties and states and the United States government, you know, we really, we really are getting to be a poorer nation in spite of the fact that the stock market is high, and that makes a bigger problem because that's sort of the malinvestment and maldistribution, which is a consequence of our Federal Reserve policy and uh, printing all that money. So I think uh, some of these frustrations that we all have is uh, because uh, it's hard to identify the problem, but I think you cannot deal with it uh, philosophically unless you understand that the current era of interventionism over the last hundred years, I think it's coming to an end. I think it's good, and I think our empire will come down. I think the Federal Reserve will fail. Uh, I think we have to concentrate on uh, what we're going to replace it with. And, and I think historically, President Trump has set himself up, I don't think he realized this, to basically be Herbert Hoover, <laughs> where, you know, he's, he's putting in place, you know, these trade wars, uh, these economic sanctions with Russia. He mentioned he didn't want to sign the bill. He said it was bad, and yet he signed it. Was he forced to by the deep state? Uh, and he signed it. So, um, you know, it, it kind of reminds me, Ron, Dr. Paul, I know you study history of how Smoot, uh, Smoot Hawley. Yeah, it is, and um, I think it was pressure by the people that appoint that he has appointed, and why he appointed him, I don't know. But uh, finally, uh, some people claim that uh, he's very much influenced by the last individual who gave him, uh, you know, a discussion and some advice, and then he's impressed with that. And uh, he he has, uh, he, you know, people come around and probably say, yeah, you might not believe this, uh, uh, but uh, you have to do it. It's going to be too chaotic. Ronald Reagan had a bit of that too, that where he he would you know preach pretty good message of libertarianism and limited government, but then he would also say, "I've never said that I was <clears throat> excuse me shrink the size of government. I've only said that I would slow the growth of government." And Reagan said that, so that's that that's not a revolution. The revolution is to change the philosophy of government and and decide what the role of government ought to be. I want to switch gears now and ask you about Alan Greenspan. Uh, you were the expert at grilling Alan Greenspan while he is Federal Reserve Chairman. He's recently come out now warning that worse stagflation is coming and a bond market collapse. Why do you think he's talking about this when, you know, he seemed to, to want to just either reflate old bubbles or create new bubbles when he was Fed Chairman? Well, uh, I think he's, he's saying, uh, about the, the collapse of the bubbles right now because they're already starting to collapse. And I think he's smart enough to know that they were there. And I think he wants to just join, uh, the bandwagon. The reason, uh, that, you know, before he went into government, he was much better and believed in the gold standard. When he was there, of course, he probably had the pressure from the deep state. He probably liked the idea of being Federal Reserve Chairman. He probably uh, convinced him that he would be uh, an obedient uh, ser a servant to, to them and to the bankers and all. But now he has a little bit more independence. And I think that uh, he realizes that he the last thing uh, people he wants people to remember him by is not saying, Oh, everything is okay, but my policies were all right, and uh, Bernanke was okay, and there are no problems. But I think uh, the handwriting's on the wall. I think the bubble's been there for a long time. I think the bond bubble, uh, I can't believe it, it doesn't burst and hasn't burst a long time ago. Uh, I think that when he talks about stagflation, I think in many ways there is stagflation. For the poor people, there's stagflation. The cost of living's up. Uh, housing costs are up. Rents are up. And uh, medical care costs are up. Education costs are up. And the government lies about how much price inflation there is. 
But uh, even if the CPI doesn't go up, I believe it actually goes higher than they say, even if it doesn't go up, it's still compatible with Austrian economics. It's, uh, it's a reflection of, uh, you know, what was happening in the 1920s. Oh, everything's okay, and market's high, it's a new era, and uh, the CPI is holding its own, so there's no inflation. Well, inflation is printing too much money, and the big, uh, the most serious consequence of that is, is too much debt, uh, and, and too much malinvestment. People invest in the wrong things. And also, it encourages uh, government expansion of its powers. And uh, it goes on and on until uh, it finally quits working. And I think uh, Greenspan is recognizing that it isn't really working that well. And he's just sort of, sort of joining on, uh, joining some of us who have been saying, you know, uh, uh, you know, things are coming to an end, uh, and he wants to do that without talking about his participation in causing the trouble. Yeah, a lot of this monetary inflation, this misallocation of capital, trillions of dollars, as the great Austrian school economists like von Mises and Rothbard said, they said it would go into the capital markets first. So, um, you know, we haven't had enormous runaway hyperinflation in consumer prices yet, but we've had, you know, ridiculous amounts of asset price inflation, and then we get... Uh, Janet Yellen making ridiculously hubristic comments about no more financial crisis in our lifetimes. Dr. Paul, that kind of reminds me of you, uh, what you said about the 1920s, how Irving Fisher, mere months before the October 1929 Black Tuesday stock market crash, said that stocks had reached a permanently high plateau. Also reminds me of what Ben Bernanke was saying when uh, before he became Federal Reserve Chairman from 2005 to 2007 about the housing market. Yeah, and uh, every time every time we get into the period like this, it's so tempting to do that. And uh, you know, I I might have a fleeting moment that lasts about two seconds. It, could it be possible? <laughs> you know, but it really, if you just think it through, it is impossible. If if it were possible to create permanent prosperity this way, uh, especially if you have control of the uh, reserve currency of the world, uh, that country wouldn't have to work anymore. Uh, we we wouldn't have to do anything. We would just you know print the money and spend it. In a way, we have done that. You know, by spending that money in China, and we get a lot of cheap products. But uh, and they've been able to. They've been willing to come back and buy our debt. Uh, but uh, ultimately, it's realized, and that's what Trump has run up to. That you still have to create something. You have to make something. And then uh, the conventional wisdom of those who want to deal with it without cutting back on anything say, well, it's all. China's fault. Uh, they're currency manipulators, and uh, and we have bad deals with them, and we have to we have to stop that, and, and they get blamed for it. But uh, n- they don't want to admit the truth that uh, we we don't have a sound currency. We have a Federal Reserve system that is doomed to fail, and that uh, fiat money doesn't work. Uh, so we're in that transition, and uh, and a lot more people are going to be recognized this. I think within the, even the next year, it's going to become more blatant uh, and, and more clear to most people that we have a serious problem in the financial and the uh, dollar system. I was reading uh, Ludwig von Mises' biography, and it talked about how uh, during the gold exchange standard after World War I, you know, without approval of Congress, without approval from voting citizens, these central banks in England, the Federal Reserve, were going in there and intervening and, you know, uh, trying to prevent gold from leaving a certain country, manipulating currency exchange rates. Do you see a lot of, uh, do you think a lot of central banks like the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Japan, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England are currently coordinating right now with maybe different forms of plunge protection team or the exchange stabilization fund to suppress gold prices, keep stock prices high. Do you, do you think that's happening? Yeah, I think they do it all the time. I think, uh, you know, especially coordinating uh, monetary policy because the other central banks and other governments uh, were very dependent on what our Fed did during the crisis, uh, you know, uh, during 2008 and 2009 because they would accept our dollars and we did a lot of bailing out and it's believed that there's over $15 trillion of, uh, of manipulation. The Exchange Stabilization Fund, you know, was set up uh, under Roosevelt and it was designed uh, – 
to uh, manipulate gold prices, uh, which was obviously contrary to the the, uh, the constitution and and uh, and good economic policy. But uh, they've they've done that a long time. So even separate from the collusion of all the central bankers and manipulating currency rates and all how they can regulate uh, sanctions and different things like that, I think that the greatest threat. Uh, to uh, their system that they are maintaining, this fiat monetary system, which has never in the history of mankind been as large as it is now, is that they cannot let gold uh, uh, be defined in the marketplace. So uh, now, before, you know, for a long time, from that time of the Bretton, uh, Bretton Woods in 45 up until the uh, early 1970s, 1968 through 71, until we closed the gold window, that we manipulated the price of gold by selling our gold. We said, that, you know, the dollar's as good as gold, and, and uh, we gave up a lot of gold, and uh, we got furious with the French because they were taking the gold. But now we can't manipulate the image of gold and the price of gold by just dumping even more because there's not enough to – satisfy anybody but what they do is they use the uh, they use the futures markets and in all the manipulations in in, uh, in the markets and the currency markets uh, to do this and uh, yet you know people say well you better stay away from gold it's a bad investment but even after all those years of fixing the rate the dollar at thirty five dollars an ounce uh, it, it was obvious it wasn't going to last but they were able to keep it at thirty five dollars an ounce for a lot of time, long years and i think what happens is they're able to manipulate it until it breaks out it broke out at 35 and then uh, finally it went up to 800 and back down to 200 and finally it broke out again and soared up to 1800 so uh, yeah they can manipulate it but the markets are more powerful than governments and central banks so the uh, the the rules the economic uh, rules are and and by nature it, it, they just can't print paper money and and fix the you know the ratio to dollars. They uh, they can do it for a while, but eventually it quits working, and I think it's working very poorly right now. Yeah, the London Gold Pool eventually ran out of physical gold. They were going to lose all their gold trying to defend that $35 gold price. Like you said, uh, they've broken sentiment for U.S. retail investors. Right now, there's a lot of American gold and silver investors that have sold their gold, silver, and mining shares, and they're chasing Bitcoin, unfortunately. But, you know, in pretty much every single crisis, whether it's after World War One with the gold exchange standard, right before the 1929 stock market crash, there's been coordinated central bank intervention, as far as I can tell from looking through history, uh, reading different people's perspectives. Keynesian economics, why don't you think it's it, it has died already? Shouldn't it have died during the 1970s stagflation? Oh, you mean the dollar? Uh, well, Keynesian economics, the philosophy, because it seems it's been disproven, oh, you know, yeah. thousands, thousands of times. I yeah, mean, yeah. Logic would tell you that, uh, you know, there's no base to it and it's very, very fragile, but uh, it probably uh, can be further explained by the subjective theory of value. Because although we know what uh, things are, you know, really of value, the people have an emotional attachment to it. So as long as the people trust the dollar, uh, and uh, and the dollar can gain its trust for various reasons by economic wealth and growth and military power. Military power has a lot to do with restoring confidence. So the confidence can last a long time after the fundamentals have showed. Well, this doesn't make any sense. So. It's it's for this reason the people who understand this are probably always too early in anticipating the problems. A lot of people gave me credit for, oh, Ron, you know, told us that this housing bubble was going to burst. But, uh, yeah, but if you were depending on me to tell you exactly what day to buy it, uh, you know, I couldn't do it. And nobody really can do that because you, the timing is variable. So, you know, we could see a housing bubble, you know, being built, uh, you know, for several, quite a few years. And then some event comes along and causes a crash. That's what we're facing right now. I mean, we're the biggest bubble I think in the world is the bond bubble, and you know they value the dollar, and that's going to come to an end. Uh, 
but uh, we don't know what day and we don't know exactly how it will evolve. We don't know whether it will happen over a month period, which I doubt it would. I think it will be just a steady erosion. But the one thing is it will make us a lot poorer and it will inevitably lead to higher interest rates and it will eventually lead to true monetary reform because the people won't be able to use that and they'll have to resort to uh, literally going back to having something in the marketplace. Some people believe that would have to be something of real value like gold. Others think that a cryptocurrency may fill in and do the trick, but it remains to be seen. Yeah, I'm in favor of competing currencies like what you've said, but I I think Keynesian economics and Marxism, I think they've morphed into religions because, you know, we can disprove them with logic and rational arguments and we can write papers on them. You know, the great Austrian school economists have disproved them many, many times and yet they don't die. And I think that's because you can't beat them with logic because essentially they've morphed into religions at this point and that's why they've survived so long. Yeah, they will, but that doesn't mean they'll survive forever. <laughs> you know, it was sort of like somebody might have used that argument uh, in 1968. You know, and say, "Well, it's thirty-five dollars an ounce, uh, and the, the banks are very powerful, and we're going to keep it at thirty-five dollars an ounce." But uh, time, uh, time told said that uh, it, it wasn't logical. It, it, it could be if you quit printing the money. So. We're not going to quit printing the money. We're not going to, on purpose, shrink the size of our government. We're not going to give up our empire. It'll go when uh, we go too far, and the religion uh, is found to be a false religion. And I think uh, your use of the term religious, religious belief and faith is a, it's an illusion. But I think, uh, I, I think eventually uh, people will lose the faith and confidence that holds it together to a large degree right now. Well, uh, a month from now, Ron, you have another Ron Paul Institute conference on Saturday, September 9th at the Dulles Airport Marriott. I was at the one last year. I got to see you speak in person, got to, saw Lou, uh, got to see Lou Rockwell speak in person. Uh, tell our listeners a little bit about that. Yes, we're lining this up, and anybody interested, uh, you know, can go to the Ron Paul Liberty Report and find out how they can uh, join us there. And uh, we're going to concentrate on uh, one issue. We're going to concentrate are on the whistleblowers, uh, you know, uh, people who who have told us what was going on uh, and then got into a lot of trouble. You know, I did an interview not too long ago with Edward Snowden. We're hoping he's going to participate by satellite, but that's not been confirmed. And it'll be on on. Uh, emphasis on that, but it would be, you know, uh, foreign policy and uh, the great dangers that faces today. Our program was on, you know, the hysteria over North Korea and why our current administration is almost obsessed with the idea of when are we going to start bombing North Korea because they are such a danger uh, to us, a country a country that uh, has one half the GDP of Vermont, our smallest state, and uh, and they've never sent troops in outside their borders, and, and we're supposed to be shaking in our boots, and uh, the American people are listening to this propaganda. The propaganda worked, you know, uh, against uh, Saddam Hussein. I'm just hoping that we can continue to wake up people, and that's one of the reasons we're having the conference, and one of the reasons we do the Ron Paul Liberty Report. Excellent. Well, I, I enjoy what you guys do with the Ron Paul Liberty Report. You guys are over a hundred thousand subscribers on your channel now. Unfortunately, uh, you know, I was speaking with Daniel McAdams about this. Uh, YouTube is censoring your channel like they're censoring mine. Uh, you know, uh, it's unfortunate what they've done with the demonetization and the censorship algorithms. Yeah, that that is uh, somebody. The market is out there, and people who understand the computer system, someday I think they should uh, be able to come up with some competition. But uh, I, I don't understand how that would work but i'm still optimistic that if we have just a relative amount of freedom people can get around uh, what google has done to us excellent well thank you again for your time okay. today dr paul and uh, i'll see you next month very good thank you very much wall street for main street needs your help youtube stole seventy two hundred dollars from wall street for main street in annualized youtube adwords revenues and they kneecapped our analytics down by more than 80% across the board since September 2016 with their new censorship algorithms to stop the rapid growth of our channel. That was money we could have used to upgrade our website, pay bills, and invest in improving our content and growing our business. Our audience of loyal listeners is all over the globe and so large now that if most or all of our listeners were to commit to donating $1 to $5 each month to our Patreon account, we could easily meet our goal on Patreon. 
Wall Street for Main Street also accepts one-time donations on our main wallstreetformainstreet.com website. That's W-A-L-L-S-T-F-O-R-M-A-I-N-S-T.com website via PayPal, gold money, or Bitcoin. We also accept donations of physical precious metals that can be mailed to us. Thanks to all listeners who have already made a donation, and thanks in advance to any listeners who make a future con- uh, donation or contribution to the growth, improvement, and success of Wall Street for Main Street.